Have you ever thought about how interesting it is that the sun, the primary source of our life, is like the one thing that we can't look at without hurting our eyes? I have. And while I don't really have answers for that, I'm not a scientist, what I do have is a beautiful tutorial all about the sun. Hello, my name is Colby Bloom, and it is day three of Painting the Wilderness World of Color. And today, we are painting a hazy golden sunset that is focusing on a bright orange sun. It's going to be super fun to paint. It might get a little messy. You might feel at various times during this scene, oh, the colors are way too muddy. I have no idea what I'm doing. Is this even going to work out? And you know what? You won't be alone because I felt those things too. I almost started over this project multiple times, but I decided to push through and I'm really excited to show you the result. So let's dive in. I have to tell you about Golden Haze. I almost redid this one. <laughs> I almost decided to just kind of scrap this version and do it again, but I decided to instead push forward and a few hours after I painted it, uh, I think it works. I think it works. I think, and we're going to talk more about that. So I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up that that happens for me all the time where I'm painting something and it just, you know, I'm experimenting and things don't always go exactly the way that I hoped and that's okay. That happens to everybody. And so if your painting is a big mess, that's okay. If you feel like you're a big mess, it's okay to be a big mess. That's just what I wanted to say while I'm prepping this sketchbook <laughs> with my tape on all four sides and my binder clips on the three open sides. And let's get going with Golden Haze. So in order to prep the surface for Golden Haze, um, this is a landscape orientation painting. So I'm using a big brush. This is a size 16 round. I feel like I'm using a different brush to get my paper wet, but I'm just paint. I'm just painting with water, clean water, to get the surface of my paper wet. And then I'm going to use quinacridone gold to paint the first layer of my scene because essentially what we're doing is creating the color that the sun is going to be. Um, but quinacridone gold can be kind of, it's very transparent, but it's also a pretty powerful color. And so you don't need a lot, especially for this very first layer. One kind of, you know, general guideline is when you're trying to preserve light, especially, is to start much lighter than you think you might need to. Um, and especially toward the bottom where I know the sun is going to be. So I just painted with pigment and then I would use water basically to bring it all the way down. Um, especially if you're nervous, if you're using a hue that you haven't ver used very often, you know, doing one or two strokes of pigment toward the top and then just using water to see how it disperses and how transparent or pigmented it is that way. It's a good way to do it. So I brought it all the way down with the water so it became this kind of light yellow and then I decided to add just a little bit more because I knew my sun was probably going to be a little bit darker than that. Um, and while I was painting, adding more pigment to my wet surface, um, I didn't just do straight, like, you know, straight lines all the way across. I also did some strokes that were like curved and that's just to add a little bit of texture, add a little bit of movement, even though it's a straight wash. Uh, that's one fun thing that you can do when you are using the wet on wet technique is if you want like a perfectly smooth gradient, then you do you try to do the same strokes, uniform strokes. But if you want to add movement, like subtle movement, then try to, um, you know, just mix up your strokes so you have different shapes and different directions. Okay, so now we're painting the sun and we're painting the sun using negative space. So this is a very, very light value scarlet lake which is like a red violet color, I mean red violet, red red orange color, scarlet lake mixed with quinacridone gold, just a little bit of quinacridone gold to make it more orange, and a lot and and, and plenty of water. So I just kind of freehanded that circle. You don't have to freehand it. You can find something to use as like to trace it if you want. But I did a lot. I did like a watery, but still kind of pigmented circle all the way around. And then I used water to spread and get my whole painting wet so that my whole painting is wet except for the circle where the sun is. And so now I'm using 
um, my, my, my number six brush to add more of that Scarlet Lake uh, to the scene. I'm going really fast, and so you might be thinking, you're going too fast, but really, it's it was just me doing like cool, hor like quick horizontal strokes so that I have some gold still, but also some of that red orange shining through. Now, the center of my sun is a little too light, so I added a little bit more Quin Gold. I think I added a little bit too much. I probably would have added a little bit less going into it, but you know, we are where we are now. So I dried that, and now we're going to repeat because you'll notice that um, the sky is much less vibrant now that it's dry. That typically happens when you paint with watercolor, it's a lot more saturated when it's wet. And so uh, it's helpful to do multiple layers when you're trying to get, you know, really bright uh, scenes like this. And so I'm just repeating the exact same thing that I did for the sun first, doing the outline of the sun and then using a wet brush to just kind of like fill the whole page with water and extend those those orange rays, the orange colors around the sun um, so that most of the background is still that gold color, but then we have the red circling the sun. Then I use Moon Glow to try to paint some kind of more shadowy clouds because this is golden haze, right? It's hazy. It's We have some... some uh, conflicting colors going on. Moon glow didn't work. Moon glow was too shadowy. And so I realized I couldn't use moon glow because it just goes on as brown. So I decided to use Rose of Ultramarine from Daniel Smith, which is a much more bright, vibrant violet. And that mixed with the Quinn Gold worked a lot better because it still looks hazy, but I can also still see the violet hues coming through. So this is one of those things that I wish that I would have done differently, right? I wish that I would have tested um, which violet I wanted to use first, but that's okay. So I just did a few strokes of that Rose of Ultramarine across the sky, and now I, while the sky is wet, I took a size six brush, I cleaned off my brush, it's, it's clean water, and I just put a few stripes of clean water with the like, with the paint on either side to do some stripes across the sun. We're gonna do this several times throughout this painting because this was an experiment, right? I'm trying to get the effect of like what happens when the sun is kind of like shrouded in the clouds and in the haze, but you can still see some of the bright parts. And so I experimented with adding a few strokes across the sun, but then it was too much. So I used a thirsty brush, which is a clean, damp brush to just kind of press and lift some of the pigment away so that I could still, so that I can see the center of the sun. And this is going to be something that we do multiple times. So I did it using a, some very, very light value rose of ultramarine to see what that looked like. I'm using a thirsty brush to lift um, some of the pigments so I can still reveal the bright parts of the sun. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way that works for me. And again, the, I told you, one of the reasons <laughs> I almost decided to just scrap this is because I, um, I did so much experimenting and it did kind of muddy that vibrant, that vibrance that I wanted to maintain in the sky. My sky did come across a little bit muddy, but I decided that it was okay. Um, I added, while the sky is still wet, I added a few more strokes of Quinn Gold, a few more strokes of that Scarlet Lake mixture, just to add even a little, you know, a little more color to the scene. Um, and I just, I tried to you know, at some point I realized, okay, almost all of my strokes are like that horizontal going from the bottom corner to the top. So I added some opposing direction strokes where I'm coming from that top left down instead um, to just try to mix up everything, to just add more contrasting movement. Um, and so essentially the rest of the sky is me going back and forth between, um, you know, adding Quinn Gold, adding Scarlet Lake, um, using a thirsty brush to lift pigment when I think there's too much going on. <laughs> and then I finally was like, okay, I just need to move on. <laughs> so um, so I took some Scarlet Lake and I, I want to for sure have that area around the sun be that like fiery orange red. And so I'm adding a few more strokes, slow strokes of Scarlet Lake around the sun and on top of the sun and across the sun, and then using water and Quinn Gold to kind of disperse it, lifting from the sun where, you know, I want it to, to maintain that really bright spot. Um, and then I called it because at some point when you add so much pigment, it makes, a little, it makes it a little muddy, like I was saying. So I decided to stop. 
And then experiment with, what if I added some stripes, some Scarlet Lake stripes across a dry sun, like I did it while it was glazed. I, I used glazing, which is painting on top of um, dried paint. And it was fine. I, I, don't, I didn't love the stripes in front of the sun, but I did decide to see what it would look like if I added some very light value rose of ultramarine um, glazed on top for the clouds. And I really liked that. I decided if I were to do this again, I would not add rose of ultramarine as uh, wet on wet into the sky. I would just add these like hazy clouds glazed on top of the sky. And so, you know, maybe I'll do it again and, and showcase that later on. But this was my first draft and I really, really loved using that big number 10 brush with really, really watery rose of ultramarine and just kind of scattering those clouds across the sky so that we still get that bright sun and we still get like the edges of gold, but we also get the haze without making tons of muddy messes. So um, there's the sky. I let it dry all the way. And now I'm adding indigo. So this is not Payne's Gray. This is indigo, Windsor Newton indigo. And I'm adding just a little mountain layer. It's pretty dark, right? Um, and because it's, I'm layering it directly on top of the sky, which is like this orange gold, it, da it darkens it right up. So it doesn't look bright blue, right? But adding that kind of blue layer does brighten up the sky um, because the subtle blues are offset against the orange. And I think that's, you know, it's a fun way to play with color is to make your neutrals still have a color. Um, so now I'm adding some trees, just some really, really uh, like thin lines for the trunks of the trees all the way across. And then um, I made sure that the trunks were all different sizes, different heights. We don't want them to look the same. And then just adding blobs on either side. This is what I like to call the blobby technique for trees. I have lots of tree painting videos in my YouTube channel if you want more practice painting trees. Um, but we're just doing some really blobby, loose trees all the way across. The trick with trees this way, with blobby trees especially, is you make sure you want to leave behind plenty of light, dry space. You don't want each tree to look like one big glob of paint, right? You want there to be little flecks of dry space. And so at some point I decided to switch to a size two brush instead of a size six brush. And I think that worked really well too. Um, so we just have this line of trees going up and down and up and down all the way across uh, to kind of complete this scene. And then I decided one last, one last round of Rose of Ultramarine glazed just along the bottom of the cloud. So I'm adding a little depth by just adding, um, like darkening up just the bottom of those kind of hazy clouds. And I really, really liked how that, the accent that that added. Um, if you're ever trying to paint clouds, one one helpful guide is that for the shadows, generally the bottoms of the clouds are more shadowed. It's not always true, but for me, the, the clouds that I try to paint, uh, it's a rule that is helpful. So there you go. There's Golden Haze. Like I said, it was kind of a big mess. It was a big experiment for me. A lot of these paintings that we're doing for this challenge are just me experimenting with figuring out how to put together um, put together these scenes just based on, you know, based on photos. So here is the loved and learned from this project for Golden Haze. I really loved the glazed clouds. It was kind of a last minute addition. I was not planning to add them, but you know, it was more me brainstorming like, ah, these wet on wet clouds are really not working out. It's just making a big muddy mess. And so how can I make it not be a big muddy mess? Well, doing wet on dry makes it so it doesn't just blend uncontrollably and it worked out really well. I love the red rim around the sun that we got and that happened because we did those multiple layers of the Scarlet Lake, right? I also loved the movement in the sky. Um, things that I learned, maybe add more blue to the mountain, skip the wet on wet violet and use like a more pure violet on top of the yellow like Rose of Ultramarine instead of Moon Glow. So this was such a really fun process for me because I learned a lot and I also learned it's okay if I'm uncomfortable, it's okay if I don't even love the painting at the end. This is all helping me grow. So thanks for painting with me and I'll see you soon.